Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our NBC Online Bible Study. Um, my name is Matthew McGlade. I'm the lead and teaching pastor at Mansell Pentecostal Church. And every Tuesday night, we have our uh, Bible study where we have a thought to think about, a question to ponder, and a text to study. Tonight, we are finishing our Bible study series uh, titled Empowered Living in the being li living the spirit led life and what we've been looking over these last few weeks we've been looking at four important functions of the holy spirit in the christian life and the witness with the key thought that the work of the holy spirit is to manifest the active presence of god in the world and in the church we've seen the importance of the holy spirit of empowering us to live the christian life of purifying us of bringing unity amongst God's people. We've also seen how God's Holy Spirit can reveal, reveal to us here God's plan and his purpose and his will for us and bringing direction and guidance. But tonight, what I wanted to look at tonight is the fifth and the final uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit. And that is that the Spirit responds to our response. The Spirit responds to our response. We must never forget that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a thing. He is, he is a person, sorry, not a thing. Uh, you know, not someone we can just uh, uh, call and uh, call upon at our own beck and call, at our own whims and needs. He is a person. That is why actually the Bible says that, you, that we can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed, you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so the Holy Spirit isn't a thing that we uh, fit into our agenda to help meet our priorities. He is a person, he is God, whom we respond to and we fit our schedule according to his schedule, our priorities according to his priorities. And because the Holy Spirit is a person, he can bestow or withdraw, withdraw blessings depending on how he sees the situation. You know, there's a famous example of this in the life of Samson. Uh, Samson is a very famous Bible character, and uh, on numerous occasions throughout his life, we see that there are numerous times when the Holy Spirit came upon him in power, and he did great feats and great, great actions. On one occasion, he was, uh, he was bound by some cords, and he was being handed over to the Philistines. And the writer of Judges says that the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and the ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. However, sadly, though Samson experienced the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, unfortunately, he lived a double life and he didn't treat the Holy Spirit as a person who has feelings, who has thoughts, whom we are to respect. And actually, he took the Holy Spirit's life or activity in his life for granted. Even though uh, God said to Samson that he was to, he, he was to live a holy life. In fact, if you know anything about the life of Samson, he was to, he was to take a Nazarite vow and he was to grow long hair as a sign of his separation uh, to, to God. Sadly, uh, Samson lived a double life. He uh, had inappropriate relations with other, other women. And uh, one occasion he was flirting with a woman by the name of Delilah. And uh, he disclosed the secret of his strength to Delilah. That, that was his long hair. Which is really a sign of his, what was meant to be a sign of his separation to God. And, and to God's purposes. And as many of you are all aware, you're familiar with the story, while Samson was sleeping on Delilah's lap, she had his hair uh, cut, and, uh, and then when she, when she woke him up saying, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, uh, and he went out to, to face them, and we have what I believe is, what, what is one of the saddest verses of Scripture in the Bible, where it says that she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. God's spirit had departed from him because he had lived a double life. He had treated God, he had taken God's spirit's activity in his life 
for granted. And he aggrieved the Holy Spirit. You know, the prophet Isaiah, when speaking of the children of Israel, said that they grieved God's Spirit when they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy and he fought against them. And so God's Spirit responds to us depending on how we respond to him. He is a person, not a thing. You know, as New Covenant believers, we need to be careful how we respond to the Holy Spirit. We, it is possible for us to resist the Holy Spirit. We can, as I mentioned before, grieve the Holy Spirit. We can even quench the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can be so locked into our formalism, if we're not careful, that we can uh, you know, fail to follow the leading of the Spirit in our life and actually miss what He wants to do among us. The importance of respecting God's Spirit even goes as far as how we treat our bodies. This is why Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so God's Spirit has made His home within us. He's made us home within our physical bodies and our bodies actually belong to Jesus. And therefore, we need to look after our bodies. We need to be careful what substances we put in our bodies. We need to be careful, you know, how we use our bodies, that we're using our bodies that are bringing glory to God, that we're not misusing or abusing our bodies. Even more serious than grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit is actually to uh, pretend to the Holy Spirit, to actually lie to the Holy Spirit. And, and that, should, that actually can bring strong judgment. When Peter rebuked Ananias, he said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received from the land. And as you know in that story in the book of Acts, at that moment Ananias fell down and he died. He was quite literally slain in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually put him to death. He took his, away his life because he lived a, a duplicitous life, a life of hypocrisy. And uh, God the Holy Spirit was not having it. He, he, felt, he thought he could lie to the Holy Spirit. Similarly, when Peter confronted Ananias' wife, Sapphira, he says, how could you conspire to test the, the Spirit of the Lord? And she also uh, died at that moment. The book of Hebrews warns of the danger of actually falling away in our relationship with, uh, with, with Christ. And severe punishment is deserved for the person who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of, gra uh, spirit of grace. And for such a person, there remains only a fearful expectation of judgment. And so there are some severe warnings, aren't there, in, in the scriptures about grieving uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit, hardening our hearts to the Holy Spirit. These are really serious issues. And yet there's one more level of, of offense against the Holy Spirit, which is even more serious than grieving or acting with, with disobedience. And it is possible to offend the Holy Spirit to such a way that his convicting work can never work on our hearts again. And by this I'm not talking about actually blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Let's read what uh, Jesus said about this. He, he said, that every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in this age or in the age to come. Now this is a very serious warning because I don't know of any sin throughout the whole of the Bible that isn't forgiven, that, that can't be forgiven. 
God can forgive the worst of sins. He can forgive every sin. But it would seem that there was this, this particular sin that Jesus refers to, the sin of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, is so serious that Jesus says there's no possibility of forgiveness against the sin, both in this age and in the age to come. And therefore, this is something that we need to take seriously. Now, many Christians often live their lives in fear and trepidation, thinking, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? What I want to say to you tonight, listen, if you are feeling like that, you most probably have not blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. It shows that your heart is sufficiently soft towards God and to His Spirit. But I think this is such an important point that we really need to unpack what does Jesus actually mean by blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. It's really important to note here that Jesus, when he speaks these words in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 12, he doesn't actually give a definition of what blasph blasphemy against the Holy Spirit actually is. But the context in which Jesus gave this instruction should at least give us an idea of what he meant. The situation in which Jesus spoke this is that he had just healed someone who was demon-possessed. And, uh, the, and the power of the Spirit was so prevalent that this person was set free, was healed, and he was both blind and deaf, and he could both see and hear. And the response of the general crowd when they witnessed this was this, is this, speaking of Jesus, is he the son of David? Is he the Messiah? And so the work and the power of the Spirit of God working through Jesus and the miracles that were performed actually created an awareness amongst the people to put their trust in Jesus as their Messiah. However, on the back of this, the religious leaders uh, denied this. And they said, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. He is not the Son of God. No, no, the Son of David, rather. Instead, he is performing these miracles through the power of Satan. And so what they were seeking to do is that they were seeking to find an alternative explanation to Jesus' ministry than the one that Jesus was actually functioning in, which was in the power of the Spirit. And this is so serious that it was in this context that Jesus warned against blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so does this mean then that blasphemy against the Spirit, the unforgivable sin, is simply to attribute to Satan, uh, 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 attribute what the Spirit of God is doing to a work of Satan? Now we need to be honest here. We know that Satan can perform counterfeit miracles. In fact, I know of someone who, uh, before he was a Christian, was a Satanist. And as part of his crowd that he was part of, he actually prayed in tongues. And uh, he actually spoke in tongues. And so Satan can counterfeit miracles. Satan can counterfeit the work of God. And the Bible says that we need to operate in the gift of discernment, the discern between the spirits, between that which is the spirit of God and that which is of the demonic realm. So we must be careful to assume that what Jesus means by blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to attribute the work of the spirit to Satan. Is it not possible that sometimes people can make an innocent, innocent mistake in that assessment. Again, it's also important to point out that Jesus didn't actually say the religious leaders had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, but they were in danger of doing so if they continued on the path that they were going on. Now, this is backed up elsewhere in the New Testament, particularly in John's writings, where John says in John 3, 18, that the person who is condemned, who commits the unforgivable sin, is the one who does not believe in Jesus as the Son of God. And given that an important work of the Holy Spirit, which we see in John 16, verses 8 and 9, is to convict and convert the sinner to put their trust and the faith in Christ, the best way, I think, to understand blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to be constantly fighting, resisting uh, against 
the convicting work of the Spirit to lead us to Christ. To be constantly hardening our heart of the convicting work of the Spirit to lead us to Christ. To try, even with the signs and wonders of Jesus in, in this church and, and even in Jesus' ministry, to attribute them to the work of, the, of, of Satan rather than to see them from what they really are as the work of God. To be constantly living that life will ultimately lead to what I understand to be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately, the person who does that is cutting off the very source of forgiveness that they can experience in Jesus Christ. And that was what the religious leaders were doing. They were hardening the heart to Jesus. They were constantly resisting the convicting work of the Spirit and life towards Christ and even intentionally uh, trying to attribute the work of Satan to, to, to the Holy Spirit. And so it is something more intentional than just innocently mistaking uh, a work of God for the work of, of, of Satan. And so I think if you are someone who is always kind of worrying whether or not you've committed the unpardonable or unforgivable sin, that probably for me is an assurance to know that you haven't, okay? And that you are loved and that you are accepted and you're braced by, braced by God because your heart is sufficiently soft to the Lord, to, to Jesus. You know, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from every sin. Uh, there's no sin that is too big or too small that he can't forgive. The only unforgivable sin is to refuse the forgiveness that is offered to you through the death of Jesus by constantly resisting the Holy Spirit. That is actually the worst and the only unforgivable sin. And that is what I believe blasphemy against the Spirit actually means. And so in the course of the last few weeks, we've seen the importance of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life and witness. Tonight we've seen that we can actually grieve, we can resist, we can quench, we can lie to, we can even blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But actually, I believe to look at this in a more positive sense, actually, we, as I said earlier on tonight, the Holy Spirit is a person. And because He is a person, that means we can actually have a wonderful life giving relationship with him we can enjoy fellowship with the holy spirit and i want to encourage you to have fellowship with the holy spirit have a friendship with the spirit of god in your life uh, you know live your life to his agenda to his leading to his directing and uh, allow him to be the dominant partner in your life and uh, as you do so i pray that you become more and more of a person of the Spirit. Well, guys, that's our thought to think about tonight. Our question to ponder is this. Uh, in your life groups, so I'll let you discuss this question. In the past, how have you responded to the conviction of the Spirit? In the past, how have you responded to the conviction of the Spirit? Have there been times when you try to ignore the Holy Spirit? And in what ways do you think you could grieve? The Holy Spirit. And what ways do you think you could grieve the Holy Spirit? And uh, the text to study, I'd like you to read Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 37. Matthew 12, verses 22 to 37. And as you're reading that text, I'd like you to answer these questions as part of the text. What was the context of Jesus' warning against blasphemy against the Spirit? So what was the context of Jesus' warning against blasphemy against the Spirit? And do you think the religious leaders actually did this? Do you think the religious leaders actually did this? Guys, thanks for listening tonight. Hope you've got something out of this. And uh, hey, listen, have a good rest of the week and a great Christmas. We will be doing a few Bible studies during the Christmas time as well. They'll be coming around. But listen, uh, Hey, have a great rest of the day, great rest of the week. Hope to see you on Sunday, and uh, God bless you all. See you soon. Bless you. Bye.